Listener Production. Welcome to Crime Insiders Forensics. For those joining us for the first time, my name's Catherine Fox. I'm a former GP, crime author and screenwriter. I'm enthralled by forensics and have spent thousands of hours researching for books and screenplays. So, I thought, why not turn my research into a podcast? Every week, you'll be joining me in discovering how forensic science is helping solve high-profile crimes in Australia and around the world. This week, how toxicology can help in the prosecution, but also the defence. I get involved in a lot of matters where someone gets up the next morning, they may have slept for three, four, five, six hours, they get up the next morning to go pick up their car, they come through a random breath test, they're stopped, they're tested and they're still over the limit. Dr Michael Robertson has over 20 years' experience working as a toxicologist. We're taking a look at one of the most common criminal matters that Michael deals with, drink driving. It's a topic which seems like a black and white issue, but, as you'll hear... It's a lot more complex than that. To get an understanding of how it all works, we're heading to Newcastle and unpacking a case involving Daniel Johns, frontman of legendary Australian band Silverchair. Often when I get involved in alcohol and driving matters, it's either what effect was alcohol having on the driver Uh, And that can be a criminal matter, it may not be a criminal matter. Uh, It may be whether or not they were above or below a specific limit. And this changes from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So above 05 is low range, 08 is mid range, and 15 is high range in a lot of places. And I'll often get involved to assess the evidence and determine whether at the time they were driving, so not the time they had the evidentiary breath test back at the booze bus or something, but at the time they were driving, were they in a different category. So if they were just over one of those limits, were they actually below that limit? With Daniel's case, it was a little bit different because I don't think there was any dispute as to the blood alcohol concentration. He had a crash. It was was a single vehicle crash. The question then became whether or not between the time of the crash and his sentencing, he had basically reduced or completely stopped using alcohol. And that was really my role, was to demonstrate to the court or assist in effect telling that story to the court, that he had in fact rehabilitated and had stopped using alcohol. And so the interesting part of that matter was that we actually looked at hair testing to assist in telling that story, where a sample of hair, I went and collected a sample of hair at the beginning and then at the end of his rehab or thereabouts, and we were able to show that his alcohol use had virtually, well, had stopped. And the hair evidence was able to demonstrate that to the court. And I mean, I'm I'm not a lawyer, I wasn't presenting any any of the information to the courtroom, but... Ultimately, his legal team was able to convince the court that he'd stopped using alcohol and he was on the right path. And the court, I think, agreed. Again, not being a lawyer, I don't know the subtleties of it all, but you know, as far as I understand, the court agreed and um, it was a good outcome for Daniel in the end, which is great. That's where I guess the forensic evidence gets used slightly differently. We weren't just dealing with a blood result or a, or a breath result. We were actually then looking at hair and what part of the story hair can tell a courtroom to assist in, uh, you know, I I guess in the bigger picture, that is, you know, what do we do with this person? So presumably people drink, finish their last drink, get in their car, and they're pulled over within 10 to 15 minutes. Mm. And so what's happening to their blood alcohol at that time? Yeah, So it it can take, depending on if, if they've eaten food or not, it can take up to an hour to absorb all of that alcohol that they've consumed. It's a fairly common pattern that people go out and socialise. They'll have a few drinks and they'll finish their drink and grab their keys and jump into their car. And then if they're pulled over either randomly or, 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 or because of some other issue, the alcohol that they've ingested is still being absorbed into their bloodstream. So their blood alcohol concentration is rising. If you take a blood sample at that point in time, the blood result is actually going to be a little bit higher than the breath result. So it doesn't necessarily work in your favour to run off and get a blood test done if that's offered to you at that point in time. But it is later on. So once you've absorbed all that alcohol, the blood alcohol concentration starts to fall. I get involved in a lot of matters where someone gets up the next morning, they may have slept for three, four, five, six hours, they get up the next morning to go pick up their car, they come through a random breath test, they're stopped, they're tested and they're still over the limit. And there's this perception that people have that once they get a good night's sleep, there's no alcohol left in their system. But if you consider, broadly speaking, one standard drink takes about an hour to 
get out of your system and you might go out and take, you know, you go and have a couple of bottles of wine with a friend at night and you've taken on board eight, nine, ten standard drinks and you go to bed at midnight. It may still be at eight in the morning. You still may well be over that limit. Uh, So I get involved in a lot of that type of matter as well. But when people get stopped, there'll be the preliminary breath test, you know, the window comes down and they'll have a brief conversation. My, my recollection of driving is used to have a nice little conversation with the police officer. These days, it's it's pretty brief. You might blow into a tube, you might speak into a into a mouthpiece. And then from that point in time, if you're over the limit, you get arrested, you get taken to either the booze bus or back to a police station where an evidentiary breath test gets performed. And that's the one you get stuck with. If that's over whatever the limit might be, 050815, you'll be charged uh, at that point. Obviously, um, You'll have your keys taken off you, and you may get offered a a blood test. That's why I say at that point in time, the blood test may or may not be a a good thing to do. But during that period of time, which can be half an hour or so, your blood result has changed, uh, or your blood alcohol concentration has changed. Often it's going up, because most people have just hopped in the car and driven. And so the evidentiary breath test doesn't necessarily reflect the blood alcohol concentration at the time you were stopped. Now, some jurisdictions are a little bit more aggressive in that space. So in New South Wales, for instance, I'm doing a report every couple of weeks trying to determine what the blood alcohol concentration may have been at the time they were driving as opposed to the evidentiary breath test. Where in Queensland, which is where I now reside, I don't think I've ever done one in 10 years. Victoria is a little bit in between. South Australia, they've got some different legislation which makes them a little more interesting. So even though we've got these per se laws, which is in effect if the sample's taken within two or three hours, depending on which jurisdiction, and it's above 05 or 08 or 15, you're deemed to be guilty of that offence. Whereas in New South Wales, in particular, they challenge it often, um, and often to good effect. Um, you know, I was in a matter last week uh, in court that, that ended up settling. I didn't have to testify because ultimately my report was presented to the police And they accepted the fact that this individual may have been mid-range. I think they blew 150. So they were right on that high range. They're guilty of high range. And uh, we were able to to demonstrate, based on their drinking history, that they actually would have been below 150 half an hour earlier when they were driving, as opposed to when they did the evidentiary breath test. So the interesting thing about forensics, I find in this country in particular, is that all the different states have different approaches they have different legislation, they have different cutoffs, they have different lawyers, clearly, but the lawyers are, some of them are aggressive, uh, that is, they'll convince their client to spend a little bit of money to try and defend uh, a drink driving charge. In other states, they put their hand up and, uh, you know, just accept that that's, that's what I was. So it's really interesting. It's, it's not just a broad application of the science to the courtroom, which is in effect all the forensic stuff is. Most of my friends and Uh, Friends in particular just think all I deal with is dead people. And in fact, that's very rare that I'm dealing with dead people, even though they think of forensics as somehow related to death. Yet, you know, it varies so widely across the country. In Tasmania, if you can go down there and replicate the drinking history and show that they were above or below the limit, they can get off. But you've got to go down and physically do the experiment. So you actually have to go down and replicate what happened on the night. So I had four drinks. This is when I started. This is when I had each of my drinks. I had a bucket of chips at this point in time. And if you can do that, and then you come up with a number that's lower, obviously for the defendant, they want to be lower than the police allege. If it comes back lower, I've been involved in a number of matters where the court have accepted that recreation of events as being the true reading, and they've ignored the police readings. But that's the only state that does that. Traditionally, people always underestimate how much they've drunk or consumed. Do you need CCTV? Do you need some sort of verification that that is the amount that this person consumed on that night? Well, it, all you have to do is convince the judge, the magistrate. Um, how that gets done is there's a range of things, as you say. It might be CCTV footage. It might be receipts from a bar. I mean, the first question I'll get asked by the police or, or the prosecutor is, you weren't there, were you? No, I wasn't. Uh, you didn't see how much they drunk? No, I didn't. So they could have drunk more alcohol than they're telling you. Yes, of course they could have. And that would then explain these results, wouldn't it, doctor? Yes, of course, that's, that would explain the results. And that's a very common um, way that I get cross-examined, and clearly it's a, it's, it's a no-brainer for the prosecutor because I can't answer yes to really any of those. Um, but there might be witnesses, there might be people that went out that night, and they will testify that, look, I was with this person all night, um, and this is all they drank, this is all I saw. And then they might produce some receipts and said this is all they drank. Um, and so it's really about... Uh, getting the judge, the magistrate, to accept that that 
evidence is reliable. And if it's then reliable, my report or anything I have to say in court uh, then falls on the back of that. If it's deemed to be unreliable, anything I say becomes irrelevant. We also see in television shows, and, and it still goes on in America, sobriety tests at the roadside. Is there any point in doing a sobriety test when you can be breath testing? Well, again, for alcohol, no. And that's the reason we introduced these laws. And it's a little bit like the drug driving laws. Uh, I was involved many years ago in assisting with setting up the drug driving laws. And it was just a lot easier not to have to demonstrate impairment. So this is the number. So with alcohol... These are, the, these are your numbers. Uh, if you're above 0.05, you're guilty. And if that's within two hours or three hours, depending on which, which jurisdiction, uh, four hours in, in, I think it's in WA is four hours. So that's even, you know, that's different again. Um, if 050 or higher, you're guilty. There's no question of impairment. And it's the same with the drug laws. If you've got, uh, again, this varies from state to state. If you've got cannabis, THC, if you've got methamphetamine or MDMA, ecstasy, in your oral fluid for a lot of the states, you're guilty. There's no question of impairment. Um, so the sobriety testing that gets done becomes irrelevant for those per se laws. Where sobriety testing does become relevant, and we don't formally have sobriety testing, but I get a lot of evidence in usually traffic crashes where we're not dealing with alcohol, we might be dealing with a drug, it might be a prescribed drug, it might be an illicit drug. Methamphetamine is very common. Not only is it used widely in this country, but it's also therefore present in people's systems when they have things like crashes. And contrary to what we can do with alcohol, with drug concentrations, you can't necessarily, I mean, there might be extreme concentrations where you can say the person was clearly, you know, affected, but we can't determine the magnitude of effect of a drug on a person just simply by looking at the number on a piece of paper that comes from a laboratory. With drugs like methamphetamine, there can be a tenfold or more difference in a drug concentration having the same effect on that person, whether they're a first time or a very occasional user, as opposed to a very frequent daily user. And so I, I can't look at a number and say, well, this is what that person was experiencing and it did or did not contribute to their behavior and the crash and, and so on and so forth. And so that's where we start to look for other evidence. And that other evidence, as I said, isn't necessarily a formal sobriety test, but it might be police officers that observe the person to be sweating a lot or rapid speech, or it might be a witness that turns up to the scene that says the guy just, he was talking gobbledygook. Um, and the crash itself can't explain those behaviours because clearly if someone looks dazed and slurred speech and so on and so forth, and we know that they've bumped their head. There may be other reasons for some of their behaviours, but that's where we look at that information and we bring all that together. And that really assists, particularly in the forensic toxicology world, the world that I live in, uh, we need that information in order to then provide an opinion because we're often asked the opinion, you know, what do the drugs mean? Uh, what, what do the effects of the drugs have on someone and what effects did they have on this person at the time of the crash. And that last question is a really difficult question to ask. Then we're asked questions such as, uh, did, you know, was, the, was the driver capable of having proper control of a motor vehicle? Now, to us in our little boffin worlds, what does proper control of a motor vehicle mean? But that's the standard that gets presented to the court. That's the terminology in a lot of the legislation. Or driving safely or unsafely. Um, you know, they drove half an hour to that point before they hit the tree. They, were, they had proper control of the vehicle up until that point. They weren't necessarily using drugs through that period of time. Does proper control mean more often than not they miss the trees or the cars? Or, you know, it's very difficult for us in our world. And we unfortunately don't get involved in how the legislation's written. So the per se laws, that 0.05 um, or the presence of, you know, cannabis in your oral fluid makes it very easy for everyone. We don't get involved in the squabbles about whether the person was or was not impaired or when they took it or any of those sorts of things. It simply was it there um, in the case of drugs. Is it there in the case of alcohol? It's, is it there above a certain level? And the other interesting thing with drugs, which is, which is fascinating, at least I find really interesting, is all the different states, depending on what laboratory your oral fluid sample goes to, you might get a positive result, you might get a negative result. 
And that's because different laboratories have different cutoff levels. So they'll report the drug as being present. If the drugs are at very low levels, some laboratories, some forensic laboratories will say not detected because it's below what they regard as their reporting limit. Other forensic laboratories will say it's there. And so not only are we dealing with um, legislation that to some extent is controversial because, again, we're not talking about impairment, we're not talking about recent use, we're just saying this person had a drug on a weekend and on a Monday morning they drove to work and they've still got residual amounts of that drug in their saliva. But depending on what state they're doing that in, you can actually then be charged with a criminal offence. In terms of drugs like Ozempic medication that look like they'll be really on the rise in the market. They're reported to reduce some of them up to 50% muscle and fat loss together, others more fat loss. How are they likely to be affecting the people who use them and their alcohol levels when they drink the same amount as they used to? Hmm. Um, be careful. Um, the uh, you, You've alluded to it. The, the two main contributors, I guess, to a blood alcohol concentration, if I set aside the actual amount of alcohol consumed, is the rate of metabolism, so how quickly someone gets rid of the alcohol that they've consumed, and often their body weight. How quickly people get rid of uh, alcohol, the greatest contribution to that is how regularly they consume alcohol. So a very regular user of alcohol metabolizes alcohol really quite quickly compared to someone that's just their social consumer of alcohol. So that's the first point. And that's before we start talking about differences between oral, you know, oral con- contraceptives and various other things that can enhance or induce enzymes and so on and so forth. But the other thing is weight. And alcohol likes water. And if you lose um, fat, the greater proportion of your body is water, which is where alcohol likes to sit. And that's often just the bloodstream and then a little bit of stuff outside the bloodstream. And so a small person that takes alcohol on board their blood alcohol concentration, you know, if you're a 50 kilogram female, and I use female because they've got a, 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 I guess, a larger proportion of adipose or fat tissue relative to water, so the alcohol doesn't have as much space to go, so it accumulates more quickly in women. Uh, there used to be that ad, I think, on uh, TV or radio, the girls, it was one standard drink per hour, and for guys, they could have two standard drinks in the first hour and then one standard drink every hour after that. Uh, and that, again, was really because guys can absorb more alcohol. And when I say absorb, we've got more water. So a 70-kilogram male has more body water than a 70-kilogram female. So the males can have a little bit more alcohol and still have the same blood alcohol concentration as a female. But a 50-kilogram female, who might be slight, each standard drink, um, and there's not too many drinks out there that only have one standard drink in them anymore, can raise their blood alcohol concentration by 0.03%. Or thereabouts. Now that's a big number. Someone that may have been 70 kilograms or 80 kilograms and they're drinking one standard drink and their blood alcohol concentration is going up by 0.15 or 0.2 and now they've lost a lot of weight, their blood alcohol concentration can be 30, 40, 50 percent higher than it was before they lost that weight, even though they've consumed the same amount of alcohol. So, and if they are down around that 50 kilogram range, you know, this this isn't a social announcement necessarily, but it's, uh, you know, if you're going to drink, you know, leave the keys at home, just Uber. Lots of judges around that say, you know, for a $25 Uber fee, you get done for 0.05 or more and you've got lawyers, you've had to engage lawyers, you've you've had to take a day off work to go to court and so on and so forth. A lot more expensive than a $25 Uber or taxi fare. It can be very dangerous if you get very slight individuals drinking alcohol just because they don't have to drink too much and they can be well over the limit. Those little bottles of wine and things you get on flights, you know, they can be 1.4 standard drinks just there. They're over the limit. They have one of those on a flight back from Sydney to Brisbane or Sydney to Melbourne or Melbourne to Sydney. They get out, they jump in their car and they try and drive. They could be over the limit, even though in their head they might be thinking, I've only had one drink. Given that that in Australia we have absolute laws that if you're over the limit, you're over the limit, there's no mitigation. It doesn't matter if you're tiny, it doesn't matter if you have an eating disorder, if it doesn't matter if you've lost all this weight. In terms of mitigating factors, do they help with sentencing? Yes. So I, I, the first thing to say is I'm not a lawyer, my partner's a lawyer, so I get to hear a lot of the, um, I guess, submissions that get put, put before a court. Um, but yeah, so, so we, we need to keep in mind there is, uh, in effect, there's two aspects of it. There's the guilt or non-guilty, not guilty. That's the first aspect. And then there's the why it may have happened. 
And that doesn't necessarily, well, it doesn't remove the guilt, but it may explain to the court why certain things happen. And the court have some level of discrepancy as to what char- uh, what sentence to give someone within a range of sentencing. And so depending on what's put before them, there may be some mitigating factors. And some of those mitigating factors may be, look, this is someone who didn't realise, you know, wasn't told, didn't realise antibiotics are a classic where blood alcohol concentrations might be higher than otherwise would have been had they not been on the antibiotics. Uh, things like, you know, reducing weight, they weren't effectively warned or told about it. And um, uh, so this is all the things that get put before a court. And that's where... Um, you know, the, the judge or the magistrate may take that into consideration when subsequently sentencing someone. And that's often the bit that we miss. We often see in the media, you know, people jumping up and down because the sentence was manifestly unjust or, or those, those sorts of things. And what people don't realise is someone may have been in jail on remand for a year, sometimes two years waiting. And so they've already done a couple of years. And so even though they might get a three or a four year sentence, they're now released because of all the reductions that they've got. And we also don't necessarily hear the closing arguments or we don't necessarily hear those mitigating factors that get put before a court that assist in, um, you know, telling that, telling that bigger story. And the courts, in my experience with the courts, is they're not there necessarily to punish people or such. If they can, particularly the lower courts, if they can help someone get a, a, a reasonable outcome and they've got some confidence that the person made a silly mistake on this one occasion... Uh, but they're going to put it behind them and they're a good person and they're going to move on and they're so on. The, the courts will encourage that and, and, and everyone in the system encourages that. The police, the, um, you know, the prosecutors, they're all, a lot of times they're out for the same outcome, which is not to have someone sent to jail, but to have someone on the right path, just don't do it again. Um, uh, it's when you hurt someone else or there's that potential for hurting someone else, I think things ramp up quite significantly, but um, a lot of that stuff is mitigation, gets before the court and the magistrate gets to determine whether or not they, you know, do or don't get a conviction. And if they get a conviction, do they get uh, jail time? And if they do get jail time, what does that jail time look like? In terms of your involvement with the Daniel Johns um, case, why did you go to rehab to take a hair sample straight away? Was that part of his sentence or was it part of a voluntary thing that he did? No, that was part of a voluntary thing. So, a- again, his legal team, in effect, quite wisely determined that as part of that, as I s- alluded to earlier on, trying to demonstrate that reduction in alcohol use. So he wanted something that reflected his, in effect, current drinking pattern. And in hair, there's a metabolite that we can detect in hair that's broadly proportional. The amount, the concentration of that metabolite, ethylglucanoride, in hair, or ETG, as we like to, we like to abbreviate as many things as we can, the concentration broadly represents their drinking pattern. And so if you look at something like a three centimetre length of hair... From the root? From the root. And look, we can, we can segment it any way we want, but generally speaking, we go from the root end and we like to look at about three centimetres. The old days where we looked at 12 centimetres, that's all gone. We're now looking at about three, three to four centimetres, somewhere along those lines. So we're looking at the average pattern of consumption over the most recent three months or thereabouts. And with Daniel, we knew that he'd been drinking. He, he put his hand up. He was, he, was a, he was a lovely guy. He put his hand up. He said, look, I've, I've had a problem with alcohol. So we went in there, we did that, and we showed that it was, it was high. That's what we expected. But then when we went back, uh, I think it was about six months later, after he'd done his rehab, he was doing a good job with, with all, you know, he'd, he'd restructured things he, 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 and um, life, I guess, was, was back on track for him. We went back in, we then looked at another three centimetre segment of him, we showed that that alcohol had disappeared, that alcohol use had disappeared. So again, we were able to write, I was able to write a report for the court that basically said, look, you know, consistent with what he's saying, the forensic evidence is consistent with what he is saying. Again, that's mitigation. That didn't determine whether he was guilty or not guilty, but it assisted the court in determining ultimately what they were going to do with him what they were going to do with the charges and convictions and so on and so forth, all the things they need to consider, the courtroom that is, or the court, and it just assists the court in, you know, look, he's turned his life around, he's doing well. There's no value to be added by jailing this person. That's right. You know, I, I'm not going to get into the, you know, the, the details of, you know, the, the court and the morals and all those sorts of things, but you're, you're right. I mean, there was no necessary no value. Uh, I guess the court found that there was no value anyway. You know, the custodial sentence wasn't going to be, he did, you know, there was enough media out there, media attention on all of this. There, there, was, there was enough, I guess, 
he was penalised enough for a number of things. But look, he put his hand up. He realised that you know it was a single vehicle crash. Thankfully, it could have been could have been worse. And again, that's what the court has to weigh up: is you know what could have happened, and and so on and so forth. So. Uh, my role in all of that is really just, you know, I have my little, I often talk about a little slice of the pizza. Uh, the court gets the gets to look at the whole pizza. I get to present, you know, a slice of the pizza or at least get involved in a slither of the information. When we talk about impairment, that it's so difficult to calculate impairment from a numerical percentage of alcohol in the blood because there are so many variables, weight, gender, fat, to muscle ratio, water, all of these things. Consent has been a massive issue in our Australian courts and there's been some very, very high-profile sexual assault accusations and trials and the issue of consent is, has been imperative to them. When the victims are consuming, or the alleged victims, are consuming alcohol, how on earth can a toxicologist actually contribute in testimony to whether or not somebody was in a position to consent? Is it possible or is it all just conjecture? Look, it's very difficult. And, um, you know, we as toxicologists, again, consent is one of those things that's more a legal term. Um, It's not something that you'll find in any of our textbooks. You know, at a certain point in time, you get so drunk, you can't consent. It doesn't exist. So, we tend to shy away as best we can f- from giving opinions that, you know, there's a psychological component to that as well. And we need to be very careful that we don't s- step outside our field of expertise. Um, there are a lot of forensic fields and disciplines and a lot of them overlap, but it's very easy to sort of get dragged out into the wrong discipline and all of a sudden you feel quite isolated, particularly if you're in a courtroom being cross-examined. Uh, it can be quite a lonely experience if you find yourself outside your area of expertise. I do a lot of sexual assault matters and alcohol is by far the leading contributor to that set of circumstances that leads to an allegation of sexual assault. Again, different people, different sizes of people, males, females, um, depending on how much they consume, they'll get to different blood alcohol concentrations. The, The nice thing about alcohol is we've done lots and lots and lots of studies over many decades now and we know that alcohol broadly speaking, has a similar effect on everyone at a certain concentration. Um, And what I mean by that is once you get to about 0.15, that's when you start to see the effects of alcohol on most people. Now, that might be impaired walking, talking. Uh, You might see that they reach out to grab a drink and they bump it before they grab it and so on and so forth. We start to see some of that. We know that as the concentrations rise above that, Um, You might start to see a bit of stumbling. They might be kneading the table or the wall to maintain balance. And before we've got to those levels, so now down at the lower levels, we've got euphoria. We've got a reduction of care and caution. Decision-making kind of goes out the window. And what I mean by that is the decisions that you make under the influence of alcohol are still decisions. They're still considered decisions. I, I, I made the decision to do that, but it was under the influence of alcohol. So I may not have made that same decision had I been sober. And that's ultimately where we're trying to tease a lot of this apart is what's the difference between consent, um, was consent given, was consent not given versus a a good decision versus a bad decision. That's where it gets alcohol. We can talk about decision making and the effects of alcohol on decision making. Can't really talk about whether or not they're in the right frame to consent unless we can demonstrate clearly that they're unconscious or they were asleep or something like that when they clearly weren't able to give consent. But short of that, we then have to look again at all the other evidence. So um, a fairly common uh, scenario that I get to see is um, someone will drink and they, they'll describe themselves as intoxicated. They're often out with a lot of friends um, who also might describe them as intoxicated. You know, they, were, they were bubbly, they were loud, or they were slurring their words, or they were stumbling, or they needed assistance getting downstairs and, and those sorts of things. All the classic types of things that alcohol can impair. Again, doesn't necessarily mean you can't consent. It just means that the decisions that you're making, and I use an analogy only because it's sort of relevant to me over the years, is, you know, you go out, you have a few drinks, you don't necessarily remember specifically how you got home, but you wake up the next day and and you wake up in bed and clearly I've made a decision to go home and clearly that was a right decision at some point in time, but I don't remember necessarily how I got home and someone might remind me the next day, I don't remember me driving you home or we jumped in a cab or an Uber or something like that. 
but I've made a decision somewhere along the lines to go home. So that's what we need to get really, we need to be really careful about the issue of consent. Memory comes up often. If you don't recall things, clearly you were so drunk you couldn't consent. And that's not the case either because memory can be impaired at relatively low concentrations. You know, you might forget bits of the night or you might forget large chunks of the night. You know, again, we can look at all that information and, and common, you know, a common scenario is someone, there will be an alleged sexual assault, something's happened and the person will then leave the environment. That might be the pub or that might be the apartment or the home or something where the offence has taken place and they'll start texting people. Um, or they'll call someone or they'll, and those texts are very, very lucid and they'll call someone and the, and the, or they'll go back to their home and the people that greet them at home, they'll come in and say, look, I think I've been sexually assaulted and the people at home say, oh, yeah, she looked like she'd had a bit to drink, but she seemed fine and she was able to explain everything that happened. And so then you're in that space of, well, clearly they weren't so confused or disoriented or any of those sorts of, I guess, uh, ways of describing some effects of alcohol because they were, they made the appropriate decision. They were able to call an Uber or they were able to send a, a pin drop to someone to tell them where they were and these sorts of things. So there's an element of premeditated decision-making that's taking place. And that just gets presented to the courtroom. I'm not there to determine whether or not they did or did not consent. Ultimately, that's for the court to determine or the jury to determine. All we can do in our field is present the evidence to the court. This is what alcohol does. Alcohol is likely to affect their decision-making. Some of the observations are consistent with alcohol. There might be a suggestion of drug, drink spiking and so on and so forth that pops up every now and then, and, and, and we might look at what evidence exists for that. Um, but that's really all we can do. And it's then for the court or the jury to determine whether or not that person's capable of giving consent. It's really not for us as toxicologists to specifically say that person was so drunk that they could not have consented. Um, clearly there are a number at the top end where, you know, I've seen some footage that's just been horrible graphic, you know, just people that are just being dragged. They, they can't walk, they can't talk, they can't do anything um, prior to, you know, an alleged sexual assault. And clearly under those circumstances, they're not capable of doing too much at all because they're largely unconscious. Isn't it possible, though, that if somebody awakes with pain or or they may not have laid down that memory, but they have this fight or flight life-threatening response that they can sober up suddenly in terms of their behaviour and their cognition, their thoughts, so that they can appear rational. Because I've actually seen um, patients who've had severe pain or bleeding and come in and they've been very lucid. But then once you sort of the adrenaline runs out, then they're suddenly totally exhausted and drunk again. Mm. Is that, you know, can you assume that that's not an act and that with adrenaline pumping that can counteract some of the effects of the alcohol? Yeah. I, look, ad adrenaline, as we know, is quite a powerful um, hormone. It's, um, you know, it's, it's interesting that we do have, I have, I've had a number of matters often for other reasons, we get involved with homicides where there's some aspect to state of mind when an act was committed. And we can talk about drug effects on people and certainly fight or flight in a situation like that is particularly relevant uh, in some matters. But to your point, with respect to alcohol, yeah, look, you know, you, you've just had a, you've experienced a traumatic event. Now you're trying to, in effect, get out. And often they're trying to, individuals will try and remove themselves from their scenario, whatever that might be, again, without inflaming the situation. So there's a level of passive response to the situation, which may not work well ultimately in a courtroom for them because there was no yelling and screaming or punching or any of those sorts of things. That was, uh, you know, almost like, a, yeah, I'm, I'm leaving now. Um, but, but very much in a passive sense. And yes, I mean, they may be... Um, you know, experiencing a bit, a bit of that adrenaline rush, the fight or flight, as you've described, um, where they're just, um, uh, you know, under the influence of, of adrenaline or the adrenaline is at least subjectively sobered people up. Another analogy is Red Bull. Uh, people will have Red Bulls towards the end of a night often and people will feel sober as a result, or they'll often describe feeling sober. Um, now, most of the studies that have been done show that the objective effects of alcohol still remain even though someone may subjectively feel more sober and alert and more stimulated because they've just had a sort of a hit of caffeine, similar to that. Uh, and as you said, you know, eventually that runs out and then, you know, the person goes back to perhaps they're, they're more 
influenced by the presence of the alcohol and they fall asleep or you know, then they um, you know, then they get home. So there's certainly, there's certainly an aspect of that. To be honest, it doesn't come up in court that often. Um, I think there's an element of speculation perhaps because there's no proof that they could have happened. And so that becomes a little more difficult to answer when I'm asked those questions. But certainly I would, you know, you'd acknowledge that that's certainly something that could happen to someone at least for a short period of time in the immediate aftermath of the alleged assault. Thank you so much for sharing your work and some of the extent of toxicology involvement that I wasn't really that aware of in terms of defence and victims and alleged accused. So thank you very much for all your time today and thank you for explaining it so clearly. Thanks so much for having me, Cathy. It's been great. Crime Insiders Forensics is a listener original production. It's hosted by me, Catherine Fox, and is produced by Ed Gooden. Sound design and imaging is by Link Kelly.